Okay, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Jean-Charles Rocher from Geneva University. I'm very happy to chair this session, this research session on da data and digital markets and money. Uh, we have two fantastic speakers this afternoon. So let me, uh, without further ado, uh, give the floor to the first speaker, who is Darren Asimoglu from MIT, who will talk about the harms of artificial intelligence. Darren, you have 20 minutes. Thank you, Jean-Charles. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. So yes, I'm going to talk about harms of AI. Uh, you know, nowadays, I think there is some uh, misapprehension about the power of big tech companies. Uh, so this is a good time to sort of step back a little bit and, uh, and, and reevaluate what AI is bringing. There are a lot, there's a lot of promise, but also some peril that we have to worry about. There's huge excitement about AI, especially based on the recent approach to AI you know, over the last 20 years or so based on machine intelligence uh, and, uh, sorry, machine learning and other statistical techniques applied to very large data sets in order to reach human parity in various tasks. And these powerful techniques uh, promise a lot, but there are also various concerns, and I'm going to argue that those concerns, though we don't know for sure the extent of uh, each one of them, they already have some major implications, but there's also some unity about where these concerns are coming from. So let me jump uh, right into a roadmap of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to first give this uni unified perspective, at least my unified perspective, of what's wrong with AI. And then I'll go through some of the examples of how the, the types of harms that AI can create in product markets, labor markets, and then social communication and politics. And then I'll talk a little bit about solutions, but more on the negative sense, because time is short. Uh, and I'll explain in particular why uh, economists' favorite two solutions, competition and more innovation, won't actually resolve these issues if they are indeed as serious as I am going to argue. So what's wrong with AI in a nutshell? So the first important observation, uh, I think everybody knows this, but it bears repeating because we, although we know it, we tend to forget it. Every technology creates winners and losers. And this depends on who is empowered and who is disempowered. And different technologies offer different menus about how different types of actors can be empowered or not. These social, economic, and political implications often depend on how we develop our collective knowledge on a particular technology platforms. And that is often done by leading players whose visions, interests, and uh, experiences matter greatly. So in this context, if you look at AI, indeed it is a very broad technological platform with a lot of flexibility, but it is an unusually centralized technology. And it is actually in the nature of AI because of its reliance on data, something I'm going to explain, its potential for automation and its potential for information gathering, all of these make it a inherently centralized technology. And for such inherently centralized technologies, it is often the case, and it's been the case uh, recently, that a few companies, often with uh, congruent visions, become dominant. And that as such, applications of AI empower large corporations and in some senses governments at the expense of citizens, consumers, and especially workers. And these, I think, are at the root of the problems that I'm going to talk about. So let me first talk about control of information, which is both about how AI works and how it is applied in a various different settings. Because data, as of course everybody knows, is the lifeblood of AI. And there is almost universal agreement in the industry and most of academia that pooling data across users is hugely beneficial. After all, if we did not believe in that, almost all of AI technologies and the way that they are organized today would be out of the window. <clears throat> Privacy concerns are recognized in this literature, but often argued to be either small or things that we can deal with, with, for example, anonymization of data or things like GDPR in, the U in Europe, does it stack up? I will argue not, uh, but since this time is short and it will take a while to get into some of the empirical issues, I'm just going to give you the conceptual argument. And, uh, and, and, and at, the, at, the, at the root of the conceptual argument is a very simple observation that whatever makes data useful, because it becomes informative about general patterns, also makes it dangerous. And in particular, let me try to capture that in this simple illustration with a simple reduced form uh, 
formulation where there are a bunch of users and each user has a privacy value VI. That could be an intrinsic privacy value. I don't want governments or corporations to know about my type, or it could be economic, meaning that I don't want to be price discriminated by products or services once you know more about me. So let's normalize the value of the data to the platform to one, just for simplicity. And imagine that the, the platform collects data about the users. And then how does it use that data? It doesn't really matter. Uh, you can think of it try to do some prediction task uh, and it try to minimize mean square error or something like entropy, it doesn't really matter. And then for simplicity, let's take two users in this, on this platform. And the social nature of data, both the benefits and the costs are gonna come from the fact that there is some unity between these two users. So I'm gonna capture that by a correlation coefficient between these two, two, two users denoted by rho. Suppose V1 is less than one and V2 is less than, greater than two, or greater than one, sorry. So in an ideal world then, you would have that user two doesn't share her data because she values her privacy a lot more than what the company can do with it, and user one would share it. But here is the problem, when user one shares her data, she is revealing information about user two. Let's take that to the extreme and suppose rho is close to one so that user one and two's data are very highly correlated. So when that happens, user is two ones sharing almost everything there is about user two. So that is the negative effect of data externality. That by itself, I think, is important and should be incorporated into our thinking. But there is something even more pernicious here. Once user one shares her data, because she's revealing everything about user two, now user two's data becomes less valuable both to herself and to the platform. You can think of it as the submodularity of information. More I know, the less is the additional information is valuable. So now, user two's data is so cheap for both her and for the platform that user two herself might actually sell her data because her own privacy has already been violated by user one's sharing of data. But once that happens, now user two sharing her data for some price now will make user one's data become more dispensable. So what happens is that in the equilibrium of this simple game that I have outlined, when rho goes to one, the price of data goes to zero, and this could be an explicit price or services paid uh, provided by the platform to the users in exchange for their data, and the, the user captures, the platform captures all of the data of the users. So you have both excessive data sharing, but also distributionally, prices are depressed and all of the gains are captured by platform. By the same logic, you can even show that if both, even if both V1 and V2 are greater than one, you can have the platform inducing both sellers to sell very cheap because there's a coordination failure between the two. So the general nature is that the social nature of data always makes AI or data-based applications a double-edged sword. We have to worry about this double-edged sword. Moreover, prices are not the right signal. So there are arguments in the literature saying, oh, users don't care about their privacy. They're not willing to pay so much for their privacy. Well, that's exactly what happens in this model. When user one shares her data, even though user two has a high intrinsic value of privacy, she won't pay much for it because her privacy is being indirectly violated already. And there's a huge distributional concerns here. Now, these immediately translate into other domains. Think of market power. The issue there was that when the platform knows more about V2, it can price discriminate, capture all the surplus, or sell that information to other sellers, other firms who can then do the price discrimination. Now, we think of that price discrimination in rather innocent ways in practice. Oh, we say, well, the, the, the platform is customizing the product. But really, that customization always comes with price discrimination. So there is always this notion that market power is going to be changed by data. Can competition help? Well, actually, it's very easy to construct simple hoteling models that shows it's exactly the opposite. Because if you have captured users and marginal users, what happens often is that data relaxes competition between two firms, and both of them tend to increase their prices regardless of whether they have access to data. So if I have access to data and Charles Charles doesn't, I get to increase my prices and do better price discrimination, but that also enables Jean Charles to increase his prices, his prices. So market power is almost generally very badly affected by additional data. So 
uh, there are a bunch of other implications here related to the nature of competition, who captures consumer surplus, how we can weed this from prices, but let me not go too much into the details because I want to jump onto something that's probably a little bit more controversial, at least among economists, but in my mind, no less important. Behavioral manipulation. Let me start by this quote from uh, these two lawyers, but many other people have said that. Once one accepts that individuals systematically behave in non-rational ways, it follows from an economic perspective that others will exploit these tendencies. Now, we know this. It's always true. It's always been true. And, of course, we uh, simplify in our discussions that we ignore some behavioral biases, but they are, of course, present. And firms do exploit them. But, in general, firms have limited ways of exploiting behavioral biases. Because behavioral biases is just like Tolstoy's families. They're all unhappy in their own ways. You know, I might be drawn to Pop-Tarts and Jean-Charles and Marcus may be crazy for chocolate chip cookies. It's very difficult to know who's going to be vulnerable to what. But therein lies the problem of AI. Once you give this all these data and the crunching capabilities to firms, they're going to know exactly our vulnerability. And we have already many examples of this where those vulnerabilities are being exploited. And there are a lot of uh, very dangerous aspects of firm customer relations in the age of behavioral manipulation. I'm not going to have time to go into the formal analysis, but essentially this can change a lot of the comparative statics, a lot of the thinking that we have. More competition may not be good, more product choice may not be good, and, uh, and more learning may not be good in general. But in my mind, and this is where actually the large part of my research has focused, the labor market is where really the most dangerous arena for AI. And that's because both the labor market effects of new technologies are very extensive, but also the labor market is where our modern society is located. We, we earn our livings, we define our social meaning, we define our social networks in the labor market. But labor market has been in a state of flux over the last 40 years. And I have argued in some of my work that this is related to the way that we use technology. Automation technologies are not news. They have been central since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. But my work shows that they have accelerated over the last 40 years. But more importantly than their acceleration, other countervailing technological changes that neutralize automation have disappeared. So in particular, what I'm going to show you, and this is the only place where I'm going to use a little bit of formalism because it's useful without getting into the detail, automation technologies always reduce the labor share and, in fact, may reduce labor demand. This is what Keynes understood in 1929, but economists have uh, sort of dismissed it with the argument that, well, things have turned out reasonably well over the last 90 years. Well, actually, the reason why they've turned out reasonably well is because they have been accompanied or counterbalanced by more human-friendly technology, things that create new tasks, increases in human productivity. And those are the ones that have seized, and they, it, show, it, it, it appears that AI is going more in the direction of this automation and not other things. So let me just give you just the simplest framework for thinking about it. Imagine that output is produced by combining tasks. So if you want to produce a piece of garment, you need to do spinning, weaving, carding, combing, uh, chemical processing, marketing, design, uh, retail, wholesale. And the key decision is whether these tasks are going to be allocated to be performed by labor or capital. So this is what I've written here in a general form. But the important thing is that the, the, of these tasks that go from N minus 1 to N, this threshold here are auto automatable. They can be performed by, uh, sorry, they, they're not automatable. They cannot be performed by capital. This threshold here, less than I, are automatable. And then the wage is either the marginal product of labor or there could be some bargaining or wage, uh, or, or wage floors like minimum wage. So what does automation do? Automation does two things, exactly. It increases productivity. So it reduces costs, increases productivity. So firms will tend to be better off. And they might hire more workers in non-automated tasks. That's why marginal product of labor may increase. But it also creates a displacement effect. And that displacement effect always reduces the labor share, always reduces labor demand, always reduces wages. So the question is, can productivity effects counterbalance displacement? The answer is absolutely no if you're looking at labor share. Labor share always goes down. 
but they may soften the blow. They will do so when the productivity effect is large. What is the productivity effect? It's very easy. It's the how much you pay for capital divided by the marginal product of capital and the same thing for labor. So the question is, how large is this productivity effect? And in fact, the problem is that AI is going very rapidly into automation. But in fact, it's actually not very good at what it does. Despite its enthusiast in Silicon Valley, most AI technologies are actually quite horrible at the, what they do. So we're getting a really bad type of automation here, which is that we don't get much cost savings, so the productivity effect is zero, so you get the worst type of automation that reduces marginal product of labor, or when there are labor market imperfections, it reduces employment. And in fact, there is empirical work from my work uh, with Outer Hazel and Restrepo showing AI is going in exactly in this direction. But what about other types of uses of technology? So, for example, you can use AI for grid generating new tasks. I've written on this extensively. Again, time is short, but I'm happy to give examples, for example, in the education and the edu uh, health, health sector. But there is very little of it going on at the moment. If you did that in the model that corresponds to an increase in N, new tasks coming in, that will also generate a productivity effect. Actually, my empirical work shows that this, these productivity effects tend to be larger, and it also creates a reinstatement effect. It reinstates labor back into the production process. It increases labor share and so on. So these new tasks are great. AI has that promise, but right now the evidence, at least the way that I'm reading, is that there isn't much of it going on. So the general lessons here is that AI, just like is in other areas, creates a lot of promises, but there are many ways of misusing AI, and right now we are going in the misuse of AI and destroying a lot of labor market opportunities, creating inequality, lower wages, lower labor demand in the market. Now, one counter argument to this is that actually AI is going to take routine tasks and leave humans to focus on tasks that require better human judgment and, 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 and other things. And in fact, that's true. Uh, my empirical work also shows that AI affects people who engage in routine office tasks or blue-collar jobs, which are sort of routine, not as routine, but anyway, routine to some extent. But I think this idea that it's going to help human judgment is, is actually bogus. First of all, there is very little evidence that that's going on. But secondly, it ignores economies of scope. You cannot be a math uh, whiz kid if you don't learn the basic routine parts of math. A lot of tasks that humans specialize in are like that. You need the routine part in order to generalize, gain contextual information and generalize insights into the more non-routine parts. So when you take the routine parts tasks away, actually AI makes humans less productive and less dispensable. Another use of AI in the labor market, and again, I'm being very fast here, but I want to give a potpourri of, a, uh, of, the, of, the, of the effects. Uh, rather than have the time to go through the exact empirical evidence and the economic mechanisms, is monitoring. So uh, it's a very well known, I have a paper on this, others have a paper on this, that uh, there are often uh, excessive incentives for excess, uh, there are often incentives for excessive monitoring. Why is that? Because at the margin, monitoring is about rent sharing. If I don't monitor Marcus, I have to pay him high wages or I have to give him a lot of share of the earnings to incentivize him. But if I monitor him, I can take those away. But that's just pure redistribution between us. So that means it's going to generate excessive incentives for rent sharing. It's a rent shifting activity. But the ability of firms to monitor workers are limited. There are a lot of things you cannot easily monitor in the normal workplace. But AI is changing that, so it's actually increasing monitoring, the best examples of this come from Amazon warehouses or driving or the delivery industries where monitoring has reached, you know, gargantuan proportions, much less autonomy for workers, and of course, lower wages, much worse working conditions for workers. Again, the distributional effects are first order. Finally, AI and politics. Since time is short, let me be even more brief here. There are many interesting and complex issues. Some of them are really fundamental to the nature of AI. For example, you know, uh, well, actually, let, let me start with this one, perils of online communication. You know, when you take socially evolved communication that's often bilateral face-to-face -to, -face to online, that's going to change the nature of communication. I think that's going to bring a lot of complications, and I think that's what we are seeing with Facebook 
with uh, Twitter, with Instagram. And, and I think we have to take those into account. But then there are additional issues about how we are using uh, AI in these platforms. And I think uh, today uh, we don't need to talk about them so much after Francis Hogan's uh, uh, revelations about Facebook. But these were things, for example, people like Cass Sunstein uh, saw 20 years ago. These shared experiences are very important for political communication, political discourse. But the ad monet monetized business model of companies like Facebook, meaning that they are trying to maximize engagement to get ad revenue, generates incentives for them to create echo chambers and uh, or, or what sometimes are called filter bubbles. So I've gone through some of this in my own theoretical work showing that actually uh, if your business model is based on maximizing engagement, it is always better to create echo chambers, especially when the underlying information is unreliable. So you get these polarized discourses especially when it's actually most harmful to do so. The, the other two things I will mention extremely briefly, big brother effects, I don't think I need to get into this much, although there are some interesting theoretical implications of how the ability of governments to monitor, monitor dissident activity changes the nature of communication and, uh, and, and, and political uh, discourse, but let me not get into that. But then the final one I wanna just uh, mention briefly you know, if indeed automation goes ahead very rapidly, it also make, tends to make labor more irrelevant. So if I automate tasks, I don't depend on labor anymore because I can have labor come and help, but it's not crucial. The key tasks have been automated. There are fewer and fewer workers that I need. But when that happens, you're really reducing labor's power in organizations. For example, unions, bargaining, picketing, having voice. But when you do that, you're also reducing labor's power in democracy. So labor's irrelevance due to automation can change the nature of democracy quite significantly. So let me conclude by saying, well, if this is a problem, can we solve it easily? Well, the instinct of most policymakers, technocrats, and economists is, well, yes, we can innovate and generate better technologies. Francis Hogan's uh, wonderful testimony to Senate only was was, was faulty in one direction. He said, she said, oh, we can generate better technologies to deal with this. Well, I don't think so. I think if the problem is the nature of innovation process, perhaps we can, in an ideal world, we can generate better technologies. But you have to take into account what are the incentives that firms are facing. So innovation by itself cannot be a solution without regulation. Sure, we can generate better technologies, but there is no guarantee that we will, and there is actually pretty much a strong presumption in my mind that if we won't, unless the right sort of regulation comes in. Competition is the other thing. We can try to do antitrust, break up Facebook, et cetera. I don't think that will help at all, actually. I, mean, I think we should definitely consider antitrust. Antitrust has fallen behind in many domains, but competition by itself will not take care of it. So if I, if I had time, I would go through each one of the uh, channels that I highlighted, but in almost in all cases, competition is either neutral or actually it can backfire because it strengthens the incentives to use data for competitive purposes. So regulation, but how to do the regulation, and that's where I will leave that to the Q&A, but I think a very important idea is the precautionary regulation principle, which I'll talk about if there are questions on this later on. Thank you, Harshal, and I look forward to- Thank you very much, uh, Darren, for this very stimulating presentation on your work on the challenges of uh, artificial intelligence. I think it shares uh, several elements with uh, what Marcus Bonomaya, our second president today, will, will talk about. He will focus on uh, digital payments, and the title of his presentation is Platforms and Tokens. So, Marcus, you have 20 minutes. Thanks a lot, uh, Joe Charles, and thanks uh, for the PIS team for inviting me and also for being together with Daron. So, I will talk about platforms and tokens, uh, different dimensions uh, to it. And first of all, you know, of course, platforms have changed a lot of things, and in particular also in, in connection with money. So of course we have smartphones, we have blockchains and the tokens, but I think as Daron says, you know, uh, we have this big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning and uh, deep learning and so forth. And the first thing I would like to touch upon is this inverse selection uh, idea. 
which is based on uh, one paper I'm discussing. And then I would like to say more about uh, the platforms themselves, how to regulate the platforms. And of course, what we will see is actually a shift from a bank-centric world where everything is done through the banks, deposit taking, lending, and payment. And payment was always some stepchild, but suddenly, you know, payment and the information attached to payments is at the center. And suddenly uh, the platforms are at the center and the uh, the creation of profit is actually moving from the banks to the platforms and the banks then just provide some funding but whom to lend to and how to collect information that's more moving to payment platforms and other platforms and many many services banking services will be attached to, to these platforms and of course then going beyond that we will have different forms of money we will have smart contracts contract uh, programmable money there will be Internet of Things, payments from machine to machine, and many of these things will really fundamentally change how money will be operating. And this conference was, uh, you know, to a large extent about all this. But what I want to focus today is essentially we have these digital platforms, and the digital platforms change the matching technology agents have, you know, or people have when they interact with each other. It makes matching much more efficient. And then we have digital tokens, which is the payment technology. And there is, you know, some interactions between the digital platforms and the digital tokens. And that's essentially what I would like to focus on. So on the one hand, you have platform economics. You know, we can talk a lot about platforms, and Joe Charles has done important work on that. But now there's a second layer. The platforms are also issuing tokens, so they're also money issuers. And there is an interesting, rich interaction between the two uh, forms of platforms. Today, I would like to focus on two things. One is the inverse selection, as I mentioned earlier, was based on some work I did with Roet Lamba and Carlos Segura Rodriguez, uh, where, you know, actually the informational advantage is really shifting dramatically. And that's also what Aron was uh, referring to. And the second thing is a joint work with Jonathan Payne on, uh, on lock-in effects. And, you know, to what in to what extent lock-ins effects are dangerous and to what extent they might be desirable. So let me go to this inverse selection. And essentially the information advantage at the moment is to a large extent with the customer, the borrower, the insurance client, and so forth. And he gets a consumer rent or consumer surplus goes to them. And that will move essentially uh, to the platform, or often the platform is organized by the seller, but it could be mostly the platform. And then the, the information rent or the, the profits are going then to the platform because the platform will actually know more about the consumer than the consumer, consumer knows about himself. So the insurance company, the asset manager, and so forth, in particular the platform, which intermediates that, will actually know more than the consumer. And that actually shifts the whole thinking we have. So we have traditionally, we have the thinking we have an adverse selection problem because the consumer knows more. And because of this adverse selection, you have to, he extracts rent and all that. But that is actually now shifting. Actually, the rent is moving to the platform. And how to get this rent, it's a particular information this platform has, and it's more the statistical information. And think of it, there are some attributes all people have the easiest way to think about it there are two attributes so two-dimensional space in a sense and the platform can really figure out the correlation between the attributes much better than anybody else can so what the platform has to do is essentially extract one attribute and then it can ex from the correlation it knows with all the other attributes it can figure out much richer what actually that the consumer is willing to pay or what the consumer needs and much more than consumer knows himself. Traditionally, this of course was also to some extent the case and here's a very uh, simple example. You know, you probably know that for if you buy a red car, you buy an identical car, but if you buy a red car, the insurance company will charge you a higher uh, insurance premium because you're more prone to uh, have an accident because simply revealing that to drive a red car uh, means that you're a more aggressive driver. And there are many, many of these examples. Of course, if once you use machine learning and deep learning and so forth, you can extract way more information, uh, which you might have never thought that somebody driving a red car is more dangerous than somebody who's driving a blue car. And 
so the formally the, the set up this model is like an informed principles problem. So the principal essentially has to elicit some little piece of information from the customer, then through the statistical knowledge he has across all the customers, he can extract way more information than then the customer has uh, himself. So in, in put, putting this in perspective, so when we had, you know, with Rothschild Stiglitz, the first generation type model was all about an, an Akalov was asymmetric information matters for markets and markets unravel because the customer knows more and there will be this asymmetric information. But these models also predicted that you know, the, the, the customers which are most risky, they would like to have the biggest uh, insurance coverage, which is not the case in the data. Then the second generation models came along where they said, okay, actually uh, the asymmetric information is multidimensional. There might be some low risk types uh, but they are also highly risk averse because the guy who are highly risk averse, they don't want to go so much into risk, but they buy a lot of insurance. So you make this multidimensional aspect. But I think what's with this big data, what will change is actually more dramatically, it's actually shifting the information advantages, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is shifting to the insurance companies or if it's organized through platforms, through to the platforms. And that actually inverses the information um, advantage, but that's why we call it inverse selection, because inverse meaning it shifts, and it also means you have to infer it essentially from uh, certain uh, elements of statistical information of that. So I think that's one big shift one has to keep in mind, and that's, you know, that says, okay, the consumer surplus is going away, so there has to be some element uh, to, to protect the consumer in some other ways. Now, the second thing, uh, the second paper I would like to refer to is the one with Jonathan Payne, where we really try to study the lock-in effects. Okay, and that's the interaction between there's some network externalities, network effects from the network you have or the platform you have initially uh, already. But now I put some tokens on top of it. And how does the interaction of the tokens make things uh, better or worse? And what you can show if you have you, this lock-in effects, it's very, very difficult for, to have competition across platforms. So uh, the ability to lock in future purchases to a platform makes it actually very difficult. So here I have a, a little picture. There's an incumbent platform, and this person essentially, he is selling a good or a service to the platform and gets in exchange, he gets a, a private token, a token from this platform. Now, later on, he might want to, has the token and wants to buy some other good from the platform as well, and then he pays with his token. But he's essentially locked in. Now let's suppose in order to swap this private token for another token from a different platform, this red new platform is a potential entrant platform, there's a fee. So the, the, the platform, the initial platform can say, if you want to swap your token for the new token, you have to pay an exchange rate fee, or you're locked in and there are a lot of fees. So, and that essentially makes, um, it's very hard for the new platform to compete because uh, the, the, the person will say, okay, I'd rather sell my services or buy my services using my token with the old incumbent platform. And that actually gives the initial platform a lot of additional rents. It has anyway through the network externalities, but this token on top of it grants uh, the platform even additional rents. So even if initially both platforms are, and then the guys can think, you know, where should I sell my services? and which private token should I get? Um, knowing what the others will do will lock you in. So you're locked in for many, many reasons. One is the network externalities, the standard one, then I come to token externalities on top of it. And if you have this, if you have some sequencing that you don't buy and sell at the same time, but you have to stretch it by holding the token for a while, you're very reluctant to go to a different platform if there is no interoperability in terms of tokens. And when I mean talk about interoperability in terms of tokens, I mean, what is the exchange rate fee? Is it, can it be easily exchanged or can it not be exchanged without any fees attached to it? So essentially, it's as if you're born in a digital currency area. So it's the same, if you're born in a country, you know, you also will start work and you're paid in dollars or in euros, and then you're locked in already, and then you also want to buy and spend that. And that's similarly in, in, this, uh, in this token world as well. And this allows the incumbent platform to extract rents through fees, through some inflation scenery. And even though it extracts rents, a new entrant platform can actually not uh, compete freely because of these uh, lock-in effects. 
And then the question is, how should we limit these lock-in effects and, and how much should we limit them? And so here, the first thing I would say, how would you limit it? And there are two ways to limit them. One, or at least, at least two ways, uh, is to just enforce interoperability across private platform. I call it currency interoperability. So essentially, if you have a token, the swap from, to another token, there can't be any exit fee, in a sense, uh, to make sure they can use one for the other uh, platform. So that's all tokens have to be usable and all the platforms and exchangeable. There has to be an exchange rate, of course, but there's no exchange rate fee to swap the tokens. Another way to implement this is to have CBDC, and that's, I won't like to coin this new term, so I call it digital legal tender. So you make essentially CBDC the legal tender on all platforms. So the regulation is whenever you offer a platform, you're obliged to use the official CBDC. Okay, so that's what I call digital, digital legal tender, without charging a fee and without granting a discount if you use the private token. So the digital CBDC or the CBDC is at equal footing to all the legal, and that's immediately uh, and allows this interoperability as well. So the currency interoperability, of course, it's not like a technology interoperability or data sharing, it's just uh, the currency interoperability. So the question is, should you, um, uh, allow or should how should should you do this interoperability? Do you want this interoperability or not? And then the first thing is yes, of course you would like to have this currency interoperability and this regulation. It depends how you implement it, but it, it's, let's say digital um, legal tender um, because it lowers the entry hurdle for new platforms. It creates more competition across the platforms. There will be more innovation. It restores efficiency. Or in the paper, you can show it actually fully installs because of this patrol competition, like it fully installs a competition. And this leads then also to more innovation in payments and so forth. But there are also arguments that you want a certain amount of lock-in effects. And you would like to have, in a, in a richer environment, you would like to have some lock-in effects because it might allow the platform to grant loans. Why is this the case? Because if you have this lock-in effects and you can exclude people from a certain token, uh, this actually is a form of punishment. And if you grant loans and there's always a danger you might not pay back the loan, uh, then you can exclude the people from the, using the payment system in the future. So the exclusion power is actually very powerful in particular, if it's a very attractive network and you want to be part of it and suddenly you can't be part of it, and this gives you ex ante the power to exclude, uh, to, to expose the power to exclude people. And that makes sure that people will pay back the loan you grant to them. So you have much more, you can collateralize essentially the payment network. And this uh, gives you more power. And if you look at Alipay and how they combine things, they have this exclusion power, and this exclusion power allows them to grant loans with a much, much smaller default probability. And so that depends where you see, okay, if this is a purely a payment network, a payment platform, uh, then actually you have, if, if you have this exclusion power, that's actually a big advantage. Sometimes you have an intermediate platform where all the activities have to go through the platform. Think of Amazon Marketplace. It's not that I sell something to Daron, it's actually, I sell it to Amazon and then Daron buys it from Amazon. Then Amazon has already this exclusion power as well. It can exclude me. And, and then in this case, uh, you know, you might not need this additional exclusion power from the payment uh, token system. So that has to be balanced. And in general, one has to see the whole thing as a whole. So the payment platform, the payment technology and the platform technology, the interaction of the two, that's the main message is really, really important to connect the two. So finally, I would like some uh, final point uh, about token differentiation. So what we will see coming forward, we will see uh, many different tokens, many different forms of private money. And there will be all different and the tokens will be differentiated and catering to different parts of the population. Some tokens will be very focused on privacy issue because people, these people care a lot about privacy. Others will have other features. Other tokens will be highly programmable because certain people will care about that. 
others want very simplistic settings. And there's a danger of segmenting the markets and you know, introducing information sensitivities. So once you have various tokens and they are programmable, conditional on many different events, then they become informationally sensitive using Bank Tormström and uh, Gary Gordon and so forth as uh, thinking in that. And that hurts the uniformity of money. That hurts a common standard. So one has to be aware of that. If you go too much in that direction, you will segment the markets and remove the common uh, unit of account, essentially a common way of uh, counting things. So let me conclude. I think what I would like, wanted to get across is there, there are platforms for goods, services, and so forth. There are all these network externalities. And then the platforms will issue their own token to lock them in into the platform on top of it. But the token alone already have all these network externalities. And then this whole thing interacts on top of it. Two points I wanted to make in particular is that once you enrich this with asymmetric information, uh, the question is where is now the information advantage? And the information advantage is actually moving to the platforms because they have the statistical information inferring the information uh, from the activities across people, which individuals don't have uh, as much as, as a platform can have, using these new technologies that Daron was talking about. And that's what we call inverse selection, because the adverse selection problem is actually now the other way around. And then you have this uh, lock-in effects in platforms and in tokens, and the incumbent platform has a, a special position there. That's why everybody's rushing to become the incumbent platform and can extract rents and it prevents potentially entrance unless this also lowers an innovation down the road. And, but on the other hand, if you have lock-in effects, then actually you can also extend some credit. Uh, and that's, that's the advantage of this lock-in effects. One has to balance these two things and it depends how the whole platform, the, the actual platform and the payment platform interacts and is designed. So how to regulate it? You can regulate it through competition with the private tokens, that's CBDC and all this, you can regulate it by having more competition across the private platform. So either you can you're, you're foster competition across private platforms, interoperability, outlaw exchange fees, or you compete directly with the tokens, with the private tokens by having CBDC as a digital uh, legal tender. And that's one way. And the other question is, should you actually separate the the platform itself, the transaction platform from the token platform, should there be, uh, be allowed to merge or not? And finally, I mentioned this uniformity of money. Once you allow more complicated forms of money, programmable money and all this, you lose and segment the market. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Marcus, for this very stimulating presentation. We, have, we now have 10 minutes for a Q&A. And maybe I would like to start uh, myself by asking Darren, um, you know, can you elaborate a little bit about your views on the Francis Hagen's testimony? You said it was excellent, but you said also there was a flaw in it. So could you say more about that? Well, no, I mean, I think I think it was excellent. Uh, the 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 only flaw in it is, you know, perhaps that was just a rhetorical device by her, but she also emphasized, you know, you know, Facebook and social media powered by these new technologies can do a lot of good. And, and I think, you know, uh, that feeds into one set of solutions that have been sort of suggested in the, uh, in the policy world and the literature is, you know, we do more innovation. So sort of if technology is the problem, then more technology is the solution. You know, I love technology as much as the next person, but I think the view that technology somehow is going to fix problems that are created by power imbalances and incentive problems is not very reasonable. Sure, we may have some technologies that create a certain types of walls and privacy uh, that protects individuals, but who's going to really develop them? And if they are developed, uh, who's going to make money from them if the business model of the existing sector remains? And, and how can you be sure that, you know, this doesn't turn into an arms race and others can innovate even more with their resources? So I think it's really critical to think of a regulatory strategy. Is there anything wrong with the incentives, market structure, power imbalances? And if the answer is yes, 
you know, those are the things that we have to tackle, not sort of bring technology as a deus ex machina to sort of hope that it's going to fix the problems. Thank you, Darren. I also have a question for both of you. I know that John Frost wants to ask something, but I would like to continue on that. I would like to uh, see um, whether you think the, there should be a, a change in the para paradigm of economic, change of focus on the type of economic theory we do. Uh, Marcus alluded to the move from adverse selection to inverse selection. But to some extent, this was already present in the old uh, uh, technology, in the old world, in the sense that, for example, insurance companies uh, had more information about many things about your health, about your life expectancy and things like that. So do you think that um, there is a, a need to change your, our economic models or can we proceed with the old ones? Uh, maybe Marcus first. Yeah, so two thoughts. First of all, I think when we write down models, we always think what are the first order forces and what are the second order forces. And when we do have a selection, we always thought, you know, in the past, it was the first order thing, the information advantage is with the customer. Of course, there's an insurance company knows many of the other dimensions. But now with these new technologies, I think it's really, you know, it's shifting dramatically. It's not, you know, shifting. It was never black and white. Uh, but our models are a little bit more black and white because otherwise they, they don't stay tractable. And that's why we have to, you know, re-emphasize different elements. The other thing is I would, wanted to say is that in many of our models, it is the case that we always have frictionless model. You might argue with these new technologies, we move to a closer to a world with fewer frictions. So we get closer to our stylized models in a sense. So in order to understand this, probably we have to have some models with more frictions and so this was the old world, and now we move to a model with less frictions. And certain frictions were actually stabilizing the economy, even though we didn't really fully recognize it. But uh, And we now remove these frictions. And then we have to understand, you know, by removing these frictions, you know, how will this change the world? And then actually we get closer to, to, to the models we are used already without frictions because they're easier to handle. Thank you. Darren, what do you think? Do you I think love, we should yeah, I love, I love Marcus's answer uh, on, you know, thinking more about the stabilizing role of frictions. I think that's a great point. Uh, but let me say something even more radical. You know, simplification, of course, was critical. And the biggest simplification that economists have made is that we have abstracted from issues of power. So who is empowered politically, socially, status-wise? And I think that made a lot of sense for certain narrow problems. but. A lot of the issues that we are facing from climate change to inequality to the power of big companies to data to AI, I think really necessitate us to bring back social power and how technologies, how different types of market structures influence who has power and how that power is used or how that power is abused. I think that is the biggest missing link from most of economic analysis. Thank you, Darren. Uh, John Frost has a question, I believe. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and thanks both to Darren and to Marcus for very insightful um, presentations. So I had a question for Darren, and it's about uh, the use of big data in uh, credit scoring in particular. I mean, there are a lot of indicators that uh, do have, you know, very uh, strong predictive power, but, you know, might be creepy. Um, you know, my social network may say a lot about my own creditworthiness, and I, yeah. I might be happy to share that information, but uh, other people may say, you know, that, that this is not appropriate to share. Um, and so there are a lot of technological possibilities to um, use indicators like this for credit scoring, but where as a society do you think we should draw the line of which types of indicators are permissible and which ones should not be used? I think that's a fantastic question, and I think there are three issues there, two of them that we mentioned already. Uh, one is that there are a lot of data externalities in that context. You know, credit relations are about who gets captures rents as well, and, uh, and when you provide too much information, that might actually distribute rents very differently. That's what I was trying to get to with the data and the market power discussions. The second one is related and 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 based on my response to Jean-Charles' question on, on social power, you know, it's really increasing the power of these platforms that collect information. Uh, that doesn't mean that the information is not valuable. It's actually quite valuable for many things, but you have to worry about, so you have to introduce some countervailing incentive. The third one I did not talk about is about transparency and relevance and fairness. So those are things that a lot of people who worry about ethics of AI 
are are, are working on. So I think uh, it's it's completely different packet in my mind that my credit score depends on you know. Uh, what I have done with my own credit card and whether I've been on time with my mortgage payments and whether I have been splurged in terms of uh, my spending from time to time versus who my friends are, because who my friends are and what they're doing is often related to race, related to socioeconomic background, where I'm living. And all of that information is creating a different layer of dependence of my economic opportunities on my initial conditions, which I think is very worrying. Thank you. Thank you, Darren. We still have time for maybe one last question. I'm very curious to, to hear what uh, Marcus thinks about this, um, uh, this uh, notion of prohibiting, essentially, um, I mean, making, um, making uh, the, uh, the CBDC the legal, legal tender, right? And so but, but mm. you need more than that. You need, to some extent, to prohibit uh, Private currencies, cryptocurrencies, or so. Could you elaborate on that? Is it legally feasible to prohibit? I, I don't, the you don't have to prohibit the private one, but uh, you prohibit that the private get a preferential tra treatment on your platform. So whenever you are willing to sell something for a private currency, you have to be willing to accept the, the legal CBDC as legal tender as well, to the same conditions. And, you know, of course, if you look at many, when, you know, certain payment systems are established, you always get a preferential treatment uh, by using the, the private token or the private payment system. And that's essentially one regulation to make it sure everybody is on the same footing. Um, okay, it's really too bad we don't have more time to discuss this fascinating issue. I would like to thank a lot Darren and Marcus for their brilliant presentations and to all the, present, to all the, the people in the room. Uh, the, attending this uh, this meeting it was uh, really interesting thank you very much thank you thank, thank you thank you Jean-Charles thanks Marcus thanks uh, everybody who was organizing it thanks everybody thank you